Hello everyone. Today's topic is on promotions, or more generally, on the effectiveness of marketing activities. Believe it or not, measuring the effectiveness of marketing activities is not that easy. For example, what if it rains? What if there's a marathon or event going on that influences the traffic? Or even worse, what if there is a accident that blocks the road to your store? And what if your competitor is running a campaign simultaneously? So all of these unexpected events might influence the results from your measurement of effectiveness. So therefore, we are going to dive into a topic that is essential for measuring the effectiveness of various things marketers do. And we are going to discuss experiments in the context of promotions. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Marketing Analytics. In this video, we talk about the promotions and experiments. In particular, we focus on how to establish causal links between marketing campaigns and the outcome. That is, when we run a promotion, do we create a profit increase? And if we do, how much is the increase? In particular, we're going to discuss how to use experiments to find out such links. First, let me ask you a set of questions. Does it make sense? Hyundai runs the deepest discounts on its vehicles each July. Throughout the year, July is the month Hyundai has the lowest monthly unit sales. So it seems like more price discounts cause lower sales. Does it make sense? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the correlation between the number of people hired in sales-related occupations and the GDP of the United States is very high. We conclude that more salespeople lead to higher GDP. Does it make sense? A survey on restaurants in Houston finds that the average age of all the participating restaurants is 10 years. We conclude that restaurant businesses last a long time. Does it make sense? Crocs had some advertising during March Madness, and the sales started to increase in April. So the advertising must have worked. So these are a set of very interesting scenarios, and they are also a very, very difficult problem to resolve analytically. In each one of these cases, we have observed an association between marketing campaigns and outcomes. The difficult question here is, are those campaigns causing those outcomes? So this is what we set out to resolve in this class. And let's review these four cases. First, Hyundai runs a campaign in July, and with a promotion, the product sales actually goes down. Why do you think that happened? Is it because the campaign didn't work? Or is it something else? So this is a phenomenon that we call reverse causality. July is the lowest sales season for Hyundai's cars. And in order to move cars off the dealer's lot, Hyundai runs promotion campaigns in July. In this case, it's not promotion causing low car sales. It's actually promotion decision is made based on low car sales. So the causal link is actually reversed. That is, low sales cause promotion, not promotion causes low sales. Second, salespeople and the GDP. Although the PES kids love to hear this, salespeople causing higher GDP, in reality, it's unlikely that GDP is driven by sales alone. Aww. What's more likely to be the case is when GDP has a higher growth, every single business is doing well. And they also hire more salespeople, and that leads to more positive impact on sales. That feeds back to GDP. So, so that scenario is what we call a simultaneity. That is, the number of sales jobs 
increases simultaneously with GDP. However, it does not indicate a larger number of salespeople cause higher GDP. And third, the longevity of restaurant business. We all know from common sense that the restaurant business is a very, very tough business to be in. Most restaurants don't last through the second year. So what happened with the survey in Houston on restaurants with a history of 10 years or longer? That is the phenomena that we call survivorship bias. That is when we run a survey on restaurants, the only restaurants who are able to participate in the survey are the restaurants that has not yet run out of a business. And they tend to be the restaurants that have been around for a while. On the other hand, the hundreds or thousands of restaurants that didn't last long, they do not live long enough to participate in the survey. So that is what we call a survivorship bias. And lastly, Crocs advertising. So Crocs runs advertising in March and sales start to pick up in April. What happens in April? April is the month where summer is about to start. And summer is the month when people actually wear Crocs more often. So the problem there is alternative causes. There are multiple causes that lead to sales increase for Crocs and advertising is only one of them. And there is a very strong competing cause that is seasonality could lead to sales increase. As you can see in all of these four cases, although the data seems to indicate an association, but when we use common sense to think about all of them, you have doubts about whether those things make sense. In fact, they don't. And it really tells us that causality is not just associations. And we need to be very careful when making causal inferences in marketing campaigns. To establish causality, we need at least three necessary conditions. First is association. So this is what we talked about using the examples. There needs to be a statistical association that A and B, the two events, are linked to each other. And second, cause A needs to precede the outcome B. And this is the case where it's not true for salespeople and GDP growth because those two are happening simultaneously. And the third is that we need to be able to rule out alternative explanations. There may be multiple causes for an outcome in order to claim that A is the cause for outcome B, we need to rule out alternative explanations. So establishing causality is very, very important in marketing because when we spend money to run advertising or promotion campaigns, when we lower prices, when we do any of these four Ps in order to boost our profit, we need to know whether what we have done has worked. For example, a Nike merchandising manager may ask, will we improve profitability if we increase price by 10% from $100 to $110. A Walmart sales manager asks, if we do this, lower the shelf space by 25%, will that significantly lower our sales of Tide detergent? An eBay marketing manager asks, if we stop buying keyword ads on Google, will it significantly decrease our sales. And this one, I actually have the answer. If you go to Google to search for any product, let's say fishing rod in this case, and if you pay attention to the ads that are running on Google's landing page, you're going to see that there is no eBay. And years ago, eBay spent a lot of money running tests on whether purchasing Google keyword ads changes their sales. The conclusion they had was no. It didn't. So that's when eBay stopped running keyword ads on Google. And if you were in eBay's condition, how would you run a test like this on Google in order to find that out? So that's something we're going to talk about in this lecture, how we run experiments. And lastly, a Facebook marketing manager may be asking, 
if we replace a picture ad with a video, will it significantly increase the conversion rate? So questions like this, they are not as easy to answer as you may think. And the only sure way to get answers to this is to conduct experiments. And putting the Facebook question in context, here are the elements that we have. So we have Facebook users. We have something we care about, whether the ads are in pictures or in videos. And we have things that we want to measure and how the conversion rate of advertising would vary when we put pictures or videos. And these are the three elements in an experiment. And then, of course, and then, of course, there are a lot of factors that may be competing explanations. Seasonality, age, income, environment, the mood, the weather, everything here could influence how a Facebook user would respond to pictures or videos, how they would react to different ads. So in general terms, here are the three elements in an experiment. Facebook users are what we call subjects. The picture versus video ads is what we call treatment. And the final ad conversion rate is what we call the outcome. So in an experiment, we have subjects. They go through different treatments. And we measure the outcome from those treatments so that we know how different treatments lead to different outcomes. And then we control for the environmental factors. So that is the whole sequence of experiments. So let me elaborate. On environment, we control for it. On the subjects, we randomize how they are assigned to different treatments. And we manipulate the treatments. So an example of Facebook ads, it's either picture or video. We manipulate that. And finally, we measure the outcome we measure the conversion rate under different treatment conditions. So next, let me show you some experiment designs. How do you like this experimental design? So we have two types of Facebook users, mobile users versus desktop users. And then we expose mobile users to picture ads and the desktop users to video ads. Then we measure the landing page visit rate and we measure the landing page visit rate. And then we compare how these two landing page visit rates differ. How do you like this experimental design? This experiment design is bad. Why? Because it instantly creates confounding factors. Here we have mobile users versus desktop users and they are exposed to different types of ads. At the end of the day, the landing page visit rates could be caused by the types of devices they use instead of the type of ads that we try to manipulate. So we will never be able to tell that apart if we do this. So this is a bad experiment design. So how about this? Let's say I improve it by splitting up Facebook users into two random groups. And then I expose them to different types of ad campaigns. Then I measure the landing page visit rates. Is this better? And is this all we need? So first, this is definitely better. However, this design has a bit of an issue because even when we do the random split, our split may not be that random. So we could be splitting these two groups using some criteria that may cause these people to be somewhat different to begin with. Although we already have a random split and we have not yet established the baseline at click-through rates. So let me revise this by adding an additional component. And this additional component allows us to measure the baseline landing page visit rate of these two groups before they are exposed to different types of ads. And then I measure the after effects. Now we have a control group and a test group. And then finally, to get the effectiveness of these two different of media ads, 
I measure the difference of T2 minus T1 versus the difference of C2 minus C1. And this is what we call a difference in difference measure. So you have two differences, the first layer of difference before and after for the test group, and then before and after for the control group. Then we compare these two differences. So this would be a good experimental design. In a separate Excel video, we're going to introduce how to use a t-test to measure the differences between two different advertising campaigns and to test whether they are statistically different. So let's say after the experiment, we establish these two groups are different, and we see that the video ads are more effective than picture ads. There are two additional measures that we use to judge whether the experiment result is useful. And the first concept is validity. Validity measures whether the outcome, whether the result is what it says it is. So to jeopardize the validity, there are two types of issues. First is what we call internal validity. In the case of internal validity, let's say we already established for one brand that video ads are more effective than picture ads. What if a competitor was running video ads on Facebook at the same time? And that would jeopardize the internal validity of the results because even internally within the experimental campaign, the competitor's video ads may have more impact on our video ads than on picture ads. So then our conclusion may be invalid even internally from the experiment. And the second type of validity is external validity. That is, we run the ad campaign on Facebook in the US, and the results may be fine in that context, but the result may not be translatable to a different environment, such as Facebook in Japan. And that is what we call an external validity. So for an experiment result to be useful, it must have internal validity. And for it to be useful beyond the context of the experiment, and then we require it to have external validity as well. And then the second concept is reliability. Reliability refers to whether the measurement will be the same again and again. So an example would be if we test a Facebook ads today versus if we were testing Facebook ads in 2015, would the result be the same? If that result changes, then there may be an issue of reliability at hand. So I've mentioned sample size. So sample size refers to how many people or how many markets or how many stores we use to test the marketing campaigns. And the question here is, does a test group of one work? So if we just test one store or one person versus another, one is the test group, one is the control group, does that work? Generally speaking, no. And I will use a Excel example to simulate how sample size would have an impact on how reliable our results are. And also separately in Excel video, I will introduce how to use a t-test to analyze experimental data and compare results. Thank you. That's all for promotions and experiments. Keep up the good work.